You're listening to the Female Fitness Systems Podcast, where we talk about fitness, nutrition, hormones, and self-care. Because let's face it, we can all use a reminder to look after ourselves more. Now here's your host, Melanie Durrett. Hey everyone, this is Melanie and this is episode 5 of the Female Fitness Systems Podcast. Thanks for listening. It's been a while since I've podcasted and that's because I've been on holidays. I was away for about 5 weeks. I was in Canada visiting my family which was fantastic. I've just returned to New Zealand and I'm back into working with clients now. You'll be hearing from me more often again and I'm working on some new blog posts and podcasts, which I'll release over the next couple of months. One of the blog posts that I'm working on at the moment is all about muscle loss as we age. It's inspired by my visit to Canada, in part because my grandma passed away while I was there, and it was really hard to see her bedridden and unable to look after herself. I know you can't completely prevent muscle loss as you age, but most people aren't doing what they could be to maintain muscle mass, probably because they don't realize how important it is and how muscle mass affects the quality of your life as you age. The other reason I was inspired to write about muscle loss is because I could see the effects of it in my own parents. Particularly my dad, who's normally a hard-charging person and wants to do things like downhill skiing, hiking, and motorbike riding now that he's retired. But he's in his early 60s and his body isn't working the way he would like it to. And I know he would benefit from weight training because as he loses muscle, he loses function more and he starts to have more aches and pains and problems with things like his knees. So while the effects are subtle at the moment, he is in his 60s, which is when the loss of muscle mass naturally starts to accelerate, particularly if you don't do anything about it. So I was really inspired when writing this blog post, and it should be out in the next couple of weeks, so watch for that. There's definitely a lot of passion and research behind it, and even if you aren't in your 50s or 60s, It's still important to be aware of how muscle loss affects you, especially if you aren't following a properly designed weight training program. While I was away, there was quite a lot of interest in what I was eating while I was on the road and how I managed family gatherings, so I'm going to make that the focus of today's podcast. I'll talk about what I do on flights, what snacks I have on the road or when I'm out for the day, and how I deal with eating differently when I'm with my family. I'll also answer a few questions submitted by listeners of the podcast about getting bulky from weight training and about whether or not coconut oil is healthy. Before we get started, I just want to say thanks again for listening. This is only my second solo podcast, but I had great reviews from the first one. If you have any questions that you'd like answered on the podcast, you can message me through the Female Fitness Systems website or through the Female Fitness Systems Facebook page. I love hearing from you, so please feel free to ask me anything, and even if I don't get to your question on the podcast, you'll definitely get an email back from me with my thoughts on your question. Okay, so let's get into today's podcast and our first topic, which is what to eat while traveling. So it's a 13-hour flight from Auckland to Vancouver, and I thought I would start by talking about what I do on international flights and in airports. The flight to Vancouver leaves quite late, usually around 8.30 p.m. If I wasn't traveling, I would have had my dinner around 7 p.m. at home, Uh, So when I am traveling, I pack my own dinner so that I can eat around that same time in the airport. The airplane food doesn't usually come out until about two hours after you've been on the flight. And by then I would be quite hungry. So that's why I prefer to just eat when I'm used to eating. I usually pack something that's easy to digest, like a roast vegetable or a barley or rice salad with a few herbs and toasted nuts. I stay away from anything raw, like raw vegetables or lettuce-based salads, just because they're harder to digest. 
The reason I like something easy to digest is because on the plane, your stomach actually gets quite gassy because of changes in cabin pressure. So I like to just give my stomach as best chance as possible at feeling good during that long 13 hour flight. Now, if I couldn't pack my dinner and I was going to eat the meal on the plane, I would choose something simple from the menu like fish and rice or lamb and mashed potatoes. On Air New Zealand, the evening meal is usually pretty good, so you've got some clean choices there. I just prefer eating my own food. Um, actually, on the way back to New Zealand, I was in Vancouver for the day and I couldn't make my own meal, so in that case, I stopped in at Whole Foods and I bought a small vegetarian salad which had couscous and chickpeas nuts and currants so it was quite simple and then on the plane I ordered the fish meal and it came with fish and pasta and I just picked the fish out and mixed it into my salad from Whole Foods and had that instead of the pasta. So the other thing I'll do is I'll bring a couple of protein bars or some homemade protein balls for snacks throughout the flight if I need them rather than eating the snack food that they give you. I usually get about six hours of sleep on those long international flights and when I wake up I like to eat something fresh so I usually try to pack a couple of mandarins just because I find the freshness of them feels really good after being on the plane that long. I love waking up and having that that burst of freshness. Uh, it just sort of feels like it resets me a little bit. And there's usually a few hours before breakfast comes out on the plane. It, it usually comes out about two hours before you arrive at your destination. So if I am hungry, it's nice to have something healthy and fresh like that to snack on. I never eat the breakfast on the planes. It's usually two not very appealing options. You're usually choosing between eggs and, and sausage, which looks quite greasy, and some cold cereal, which is not very satisfying. And there's always some sugary yogurt on the side. So if I'm leaving from home, I'll make some homemade protein pancakes or protein banana bread that packs really easily. And I'll have that for breakfast instead of what's served on the airplane meal. If I'm not coming from home, say in this case, like when I came from Vancouver and was going back to New Zealand, I couldn't make my own breakfast first. So I just made sure that I had some fruit and protein bars in my bag and I ate that for breakfast instead. As far as protein bars go, I try to find bars that are lower in sugar and have some greens or other, something healthy in them rather than just like plain ones that are sort of like more like chocolate bars than anything else. So my favorite bars at the moment are these fermented green bars made by Genuine Health. And I also like the Vega One bars, which are meant to be a meal replacement bar. I mean, both of them have a decent amount of, of sugar in them, but at least they've got some other stuff in them, which makes them feel like they're at least sort of healthy. The other thing I did this time around, which I've never done before when traveling, is I grabbed some single sachet serves of electrolytes made by Vega. I got them at Whole Foods and I thought they might help me feel better. I'm not sure if they did, but they tasted quite nice. I emptied them into my water bottle on the plane and just shook them up and drank that in the morning with my breakfast. And it probably help just refresh my body a bit. So you might think all of this is a hassle, packing your own meals and buying all this stuff before you get on the plane, but I'm sure this is a big part of why I don't feel jet lagged when I travel internationally. And honestly, it just tastes so much better. Usually the flight attendants are envious of my food when they see me eating it. Uh, it just, it feels nice to treat yourself a bit when you're on a long flight like that and eat something you really enjoy. And you'll just feel a heck of a lot better when you get to your destination. So hopefully there's some ideas in there for you. I should probably turn that into a blog post at some point in the near future. So watch for that. Maybe I'll do it around Christmas time when 
you'll be more likely to be on the road and traveling and need some ideas of what to eat. Okay, so that's what to eat while you're on the road, and now let's get into our listener questions. The first question I was going to address has actually come from several different clients while I was away on holidays. And these clients were wondering if they were going to get bulky from training weights. I talk a lot about this on the Female Fitness Systems blog because I've been one of those people who got what many women call bulky from lifting weights. But you have to understand that muscle is not necessarily bulky. In fact, if you put it in the right place, it's going to make you look really awesome. So what these women are worried about is whether or not they're going to get bigger from lifting weights, especially in the legs. This is an area of concern for a lot of women. And it's a legitimate worry because you have to realize that While most women aren't going to get bulky from lifting weights, some do increase the size of certain parts of their body, and it's often the legs for women. However, not every woman is going to get bulky from lifting weights, and sometimes that bulkiness is not muscle, but it's just that you've got some weight to lose still. So um, what determines whether or not you'll get bulky from putting on too much muscle Well, there's a few factors at play. The first one is genetics and the shape of your body, your natural body shape. So if you're one of those taller, naturally lean women, you probably don't have a problem staying lean. Even as you've gotten older, you've probably always had that nice, long, lean torso. Maybe you've got longer limbs. If you're one of these ladies, you probably don't have to worry about getting bulky from lifting weights. Those long and lean body types tend to not build muscle as easily, and they don't have the rounder, more full muscle bellies that you'll find on other body types, like a mesomorph body type, which does put on muscle easily. It's the mesomorph body types that I usually encourage to pay more attention to how their bodies are changing and whether they feel as though certain areas like their legs and their back are starting to grow and thicken up. I'm one of those women. Like personally, I just walk by a squat rack and my legs start to grow. I've always had to take it easy on back training as well because it's very easy for me to develop a wide back with big lats that hang over my tank tops and make dress wearing impossible because I can't do up any of the zippers uh, from my middle back and up. So if you put on muscle easily, you might be one of these mesomorph body types and in that sense you do have to be more careful and assess yourself regularly. But just because you have that body type doesn't mean you will get bulky because there's other things that will influence that. Whether you gain too much muscle will also depend on how hard you train and whether your training program is designed for muscle growth. Just because you go to the gym and lift weights doesn't necessarily mean you'll build a lot of muscle. That's why most women aren't walking around with lots of muscle. It takes a lot of effort to gain muscle, especially for females and even for the ones that gain muscle easily. We just don't gain muscle like men do and we aren't following hardcore weightlifting programs usually. So... For example, myself, I trained weights for almost 10 years without putting on any muscle or bulk because I wasn't following a properly designed weight training program. It was only once I learned how to train properly and started training more like a bodybuilder would train that I gained real muscle. My legs got bulky because I was doing ridiculously heavy squats and leg presses and lunges Since I stopped doing these exercises, I look way better, but when I didn't know what I was doing and I was training really hard like a bodybuilder, then I got bulkier. So if you're worried about getting bulky, your exercise program and that exercise selection is really important. 
If you think you're going to shake, shape up your legs by doing really heavy squats, well, depending on your genetics, you could be disappointed. With my genetics, if I tried to rely on squats to shape up my legs, they would just get thicker and thicker and bigger and bigger. My jeans would get tighter and they just would have no shape at all. So I've written extensively on the Female Fitness Systems blog about choosing leg exercises based on your body shape. I recommend you pop over to the website and read some of those articles to get started. I also regularly post leg exercise videos on Facebook. So make sure you follow the Female Fitness Systems Facebook page and you can start experimenting with some of the new exercises you'll see there. So exercise and genetics are two of the main factors that determine whether or not you're going to get bulky, but it also depends on how many calories you're eating. When guys want to gain muscle, they will go on what's called a bulking diet, meaning that they overeat to give their body enough calories to grow muscle. Muscle requires the extra energy to grow, and that's why they need to eat so much to help support the muscle growth. If you're in a calorie deficit, like most women who are trying to lose weight, you're probably not going to get bulky, at least not from gaining too much muscle because you don't have the calories that your body needs to build a lot of muscle. So if you're eating clean and losing weight, you're probably not going to be getting bulky from gaining muscle. The final thing I want to say is that you have to stop guessing about your physique. If you're worried about getting bulky, you've got to take some measurements, photos, you've got to weigh yourself regularly. You've also got to track your weight for a few months using some sort of menstrual cycle tracking app to figure out what times of the month you put on weight. Too many women don't know their cycles and freak out when they feel a bit more bloated or heavier at certain times of the month. I mean, let's face it, for most of us, there are certain times of the month where we feel more bulky just because we're more bloated and our bodies just feel gross. And if you know when those times of the month are, then you can stop freaking out when that happens. And the only way you're going to figure that out is by just measuring and tracking everything for a few months and just being on top of all that. If you're a client of mine, you've heard this advice before. It's the only way that I'm going to be able to work with you to determine what's going on. I can't tell you if you've actually gained weight or if it's menstrual cycle weight or if you're getting bulky unless I've got all your data and progress photos to see what's going on. If you're not a client, then you've got to do that work yourself. But the more of these things you have, then the better you can assess yourself. I want to say one more thing before wrapping up this topic. I get just a little bit annoyed by the fitness bloggers and experts out there. Often they're men who say that women won't get bulky from lifting weights. I get why they do it. They're trying to make women not afraid to lift weights. And the point is that... You know, most women are not going to get bulky from lifting weights. You look bulky because you've got some extra weight to lose. So I get that. But it's also important that you realize that some women do get bulky from lifting weights, especially if you're a mesomorph. And I've experienced this and I've seen it with my clients as well. And it just goes back to the importance of assessing yourself and, you know, don't take somebody else's word for it. Get on top of your fitness and monitoring yourself and and take control of that aspect and only you can assess whether you're getting bulky. Some fitness expert can't tell you that you're not going to get bulky because they don't know what your body type is. So that's just my my little rant on it. Um, I think if I had known that when I started training, I would have I wouldn't have got to the point that I got where I had to take a whole year to try to take some size off of my legs. And I still feel that I'm suffering from a really wide back. And I wish that I had changed my training when I started, but I didn't know back then how to do all of this. So I'm hoping that you can take something away from this podcast that stops you from getting to that point if you are one of these ladies who puts on muscle really easily. It's a legitimate concern, so don't let somebody tell you that it's not. 
Okay, so shifting gears, and we'll move on to our second question, which is a nutrition-related question. This question comes from Amy, who was wondering about coconut oil. She was wondering if it's actually good for you because she's heard conflicting opinions. So first of all, in answering this question, I want you to remember with nutrition, there's often no clear answer because it depends on you and what your body needs. Also, it's often not black and white. It's usually about moderation, so the answer is somewhere in the middle. To start, yes, coconut oil has a lot of health benefits. That's why it's become so popular. I'm not going to list those health benefits here because if you spend any time on social media, I'm sure you're aware of what those benefits are. Actually, my favorite thing about coconut oil has nothing to do with its health benefits. I actually love using coconut oil as an eye makeup remover. You only need a small bit of it. I just take a little um, cloth and a small bit of coconut oil and I'll just wipe both eyes and eye makeup comes off so beautifully and it moisturizes your eye at the same your eye area at the same time. So that's my favorite benefit of coconut oil. Not really a health benefit, but kind of a cool thing you can do with the coconut oil you've got in the house. So back to Amy's question though, as I was saying, there's no clear answer when it comes to nutrition and that's because everyone is different. So to answer this question, I'm going to do it from the perspective of somebody, so let's say a woman who's between about 30 to 50 years old. She might be dealing with some changing hormones and maybe a little bit of extra weight gain that she just didn't have in her 20s and early 30s. And so she wants to be healthier and she's starting to experiment with stuff like bliss balls and all those kind of things and reading about paleo and low carb diets and she's starting to use coconut oil. So this is a perspective that we're going to bring to this question. Perspective is important because for this woman, my answer would be different than say, a guy in his 30s who was training weights really hard and needs to boost testosterone and all that sort of stuff. So just keep that in mind for the purpose of this answer. We're talking about uh, this woman that I've just painted a picture of. So for her, coconut oil can be healthy and useful in small amounts, but probably not in the quantities you would see paleo or low-carb diets promoting. People who follow paleo can eat very high fat diets. That's their diets are often like 70% fat. And so coconut oil from their point of view is really healthy and they eat a lot of it. Some even put it in their coffee in the morning. I'm not bashing paleo because some people do very well on it. However, it's not what I follow and it's not what I recommend for my clients usually. If you've read any of my blog posts lately on nutrition, you'll know that I'm becoming more and more a fan of low to moderate fat intake because of how it affects our hormones and specifically estrogen levels. If a woman struggles with estrogen dominant conditions like heavy periods, fibroids, uh, estrogen-related cancers, and even stuff like cellulite, research suggests that these women will benefit from a lower-fat diet. Low-fat diets are effective because they've been shown to decrease the estrogens that cause female problems, and even some hormone-related cancers like breast cancer. On high-fat diets, your estrogen levels actually increase. So when women reduce the fat in their diets, their estrogen levels drop noticeably in a really short time. That's why diet can powerfully impact your hormones and you can notice changes in even one cycle. It runs counter to a lot of things you're hearing right now on social media and from a lot of these fitness experts promoting these low carb or ketogenic or paleo diets but the research shows that especially if you're one of these women who have an estrogen related condition and a lot of women in their 30s and 40s are suffering from these things the research is clear that low fat diets are very helpful so regardless of how healthy coconut oil may be it's still a fat and it contributes significantly towards your overall fat intake 
And from the perspective of keeping estrogen levels at a healthy level, too much coconut oil can be problematic. Another problem that I have with people who promote coconut oil, like these paleo or ketogenic people, is that they'll say that coconut oil is, a, is fat burning. I have a real problem with this because at the end of the day, coconut oil is a fat. It has calories. There's no magic properties to it that make it fat burning. For every gram of fat that you consume, you get nine calories. If you compare this with carbs, every gram of carb you consume, you get four calories. So gram for gram, fat is a lot more calorically dense. That's why coconut oil isn't fat burning at all. In fact, it's way more calorically dense than eating the same amount of carbs. I often see women start on diets like paleo or they start making a lot of bliss balls and all these recipes you get on Pinterest and they're using a lot of coconut oil and they can't figure out why they're gaining weight. The quantity of fat that you can eat is really small before the calories start to pile on and a serving of fat is actually a lot smaller than you would think. If you've never weighed out a serving of fat, I challenge you to take a food scale and weigh out your serving of coconut oil or a serving of peanut butter and you'll be surprised and probably a bit disappointed by how small a serving size actually is. So to sum all that up, is coconut oil good for you? Yeah, it has a lot of health benefits, but at the end of the day, you have to remember that it's still fat, it's very calorically dense, and if you're one of these women who struggles with some estrogen-dominant-like conditions, then you might benefit from reducing fat overall in your diet, and in that sense, then, you know, watch your intake of coconut oil because there's nothing magic about it. It's still a fat and it's going to affect your hormones in the same way as a lot of other fats. Well, that's everything from me today. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, if you have any questions that you'd like me to answer on the next podcast, you can message me through the website or on Facebook. You can also email me. My email is mel, just M-E-L, at femalefitnesssystems.com. I want to make these podcasts as helpful as possible for you, so I would love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening, and have a great day.